in Brisbane, Australia, in 1982 to celebrate the 12th Commonwealth Games. May they display cheerfulness and concord so that the spirit of our family of nations may be carried on with ever greater eagerness, courage, and humor for the good of humanity and the peace of the world. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the opening ceremony of the 12th Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. I'd like to tell you it's a lovely sunny day here in Brisbane. It is sunny, but I'm afraid it's blowing a gale and let's just hope that that wind that's out there gusting to about 25 knots around QE2 isn't going to spoil the festival and the pageantry of this opening ceremony. It's a magnificent spectacle already. There's 58,000 people gathered out there at the Queen Elizabeth II Jubilee Sports Centre that we all know as QE2. There are 500 million people watching all around the world after nine years of preparation, $30 million or more than that in expense on venues, the stage is set for the start of these magnificent Commonwealth Games. His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh is on his way to the stadium and should be there in about 15 minutes to officially open the Games, but already the dignitaries have been arriving and clutching onto their hats in these high winds that are there, so let's have a look at the arrival of some of them. First, Alderman Roy Harvey, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, with his wife Mrs Harvey, and he was elected only this year as successor to Frank Sleeman, after whom the Chandler Complex will be named at the conclusion of these games. There you can see the breeze and Mrs Hardy clutching onto her hat. Before that we had Brian Walsh and Clem Jones, and Clem Jones it was who originally was the man who instigated the proposal for the Commonwealth Games to be held in Brisbane. There he is, the Premier of Queensland, the Honourable J. B. Ockie Peterson being greeted by Sir Edward or Ned Williams, who's the chairman of the Commonwealth Games Foundation, and his wife, who now is just as well known as he is. There's the symbol, a magnificent shot from our helicopter of the symbol for the Commonwealth Games, the flying kangaroo. The Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Malcolm Fraser, and he looks really pleased to be there, and why not? What a magnificent spectacle. There's his wife, Tammy, and uh, Sir Edward Williams greeting them and showing them to their seats. And finally, the Governor of Queensland, His Excellency Sir James Ramsey, just about to alight from his car and wearing a hat. And I don't think it's a great day for hats. When they handed out jobs, I think they should have thought of an official hat holder because Sir James Ramsey uh, very wisely, I think, doffed his hat as he's greeted by Sir Edward Williams. Sir James Ramsey and his wife, Mrs Ramsey, just looking around and taking in the spectacle of this magnificent moment. They call the Commonwealth Games the Friendly Games, and I think it's very appropriate because Queensland, perhaps the least formal and the most friendly of all the states, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying that, I'm a former New South Welshman myself, but the stage is set out there. Let's go to our commentators, Norman Gold, Gold, Gold May, and Geraldine Nationwide Doog at QE2. And here from QE2, we're looking out at this remarkable scene. The place is absolutely jam-packed to capacity, and there's the cook of air to indicate that the ceremony is about to start. And we look from the helicopter of you. This is coming across from the village. I just let the helicopter finish first of all. And from that a traditional Australian sound, we're just coming across the village and further in the background. And you can hear the Kiwis first of all. We'll do that too. to QE's, how Australian can be getting. There it is, the QE2 Stadium from the air, this magnificent venue, jam-packed today with 60,000 people, and despite the cooler weather, the strong breezes, we can still feel that tingle of excitement. And for me, it's my 11th game, and uh, for you, Geraldine, what is it, number two? It's number two, Norman, yes. I was a, a little girl in the uh, Commonwealth Games Stadium in Perth in 1962. It was memorable, but I can tell this is going to be an even more memorable day.
ladies and gentlemen, Brisbane, the sunshine capital of Queensland, the sunshine state of Australia, welcomes you to the 12th Commonwealth Games. And to those of you all over Australia, welcome to the ABC's direct telecast, which is going to go unbroken through till about 5 o'clock this afternoon. That's local time, and you'll see it all here on the ABC. A magnificent camera coverage, the colour, the excitement, the spectacle, as the band comes on now, the ceremonial band, the Australian Army Band, led by drum major Kevin Batterby, and this will be followed by the Garden Honour, and then the arrival of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. And just behind the band, you know, the That's Guard of Honor coming on. Band, yes, the Guard of Honor is from the 8th and 9th That's Battalions. And there's the view looking down from the grandstand now, and those two giant scoreboards in the background, and look at the mob there, and that is aluminium uh, temporary seating, this capacity crowd, and as the band marches through, followed by the Guard of Honour, and don't they look good. Royal Guard of Honour, incidentally, was formed in 1973, and in Vietnam, it was, as a unit, received the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry Award Citation for Outstanding Service. And here he is, ceremonial ah. mascot. First sheep I've ever seen wearing goggles. Not quite exactly in step, though, Gerald, is it? <laughs> the soldier of the Queen, this brings us back to breaking around to the... Very popular in Australia, and that uh, great Australian movie is a tribute they're playing the soldiers of the Queen because listen to the crowd, they realise that uh, I, I imagine the break around is one of the Australian, great Australian movies, and to have an Australian movie industry as we do so, so improved in the last 10 years, this is very appropriate. And it has just been re released, I heard yesterday from a film bar. Just been re released, which is quite remarkable considering it was only released about five years ago, I think, wasn't it? I wonder if Jack Thompson is watching this telecast. Wherever he is in Australia, good luck to you, Jack. So there it is, it's all ready now. And the applause from this very appreciative and enthusiastic crowd of 60,000 people. And a remarkable feature, Geraldine, was the welcome the Premier and the Prime Minister got. It certainly was. We, uh, we did take a little count of the slight difference, I'd say. Mr Fraser probably came out a little bit on top, but there was. Remarkable ovation from the crowd. And a precision performance by the Guard of Honour. And we are standing by now for the arrival of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. And you can see the sort of wind that is providing problems even now. As Peter Mears said, not the day to be wearing a hat. And off goes some of the hats, uh, just as you speak, there's four or five or six of them down on the ground. Now you notice the starch hats there on the ground, I just want to see what they'll do there, whether they, one of the officers will come out and pick them up and return, and we can see a soldier, two or three in the second rank has lost I'm their hats. I'm just trying to find where they yes, are. Yes, in the second rank they are, the second rank ah, on the yes. left hand side, there are three of them. Yes. And I should think that we, an effort would be made to get them back to full military uniform, because it's nice to see the slouch hat, which is so typically Australian, using this guard of honour. And that's a precision piece of drill, and I don't think they'll do anything regarding those hats and the team until the Guard of Honour is asked to stand at ease. The 
wind is gusting here today, 20 to 30 knots, it's very, very heavy. Gary Ticehurst, our helicopter pilot, uh, told some of our people, Norman, that it is in fact 30 knots. Down at the southwestern corner of the arena. I think it's dropped just a little low, don't you, Norman, yes, when we has, first arrived? Yes, it has come down a little bit, and it may have changed slightly. Now, let's see what's going to happen here about these hats, whether they pick them up. They are now in position what the procedure is of a guard of honour, whether they're going to stay where they are. I see down the southwestern or southeastern corner all of the uh, photographers waiting for the arrival of the Duke of Edinburgh. Now, there's the stand of these. Now, this is the time it could happen if they're going to do anything about it at all. I see that um, two yes. of the sort of usher but here there's a car coming up. The first of the dignitaries are about to arrive. And here, first of all, who's first, uh, Geraldine? Sir Edward Williams and Lady Williams uh, will be welcoming the first of the distinguished guests, Sir Alexander and Lady Ross. Sir Alexander has been chairman of the Commonwealth Games Federation for many years now, and he's always a prominent figure in any Games opening. And now, these cars are going to come on fairly quick succession, and Sir Alexander Ross is followed by Mr Mbathi of Kenya, who's the vice president of the Commonwealth Games Federation. And I think following him, we're awaiting the arrival, I think it should come very shortly, of Mr. Les Martin. Yes. Now Sir this, Les is, this is the car carrying Sir Alexander Ross, first of all, isn't it, Geraldine? That's coming down first now. And Mr. Mbatha behind it. The car carrying Les Martin is already on the track. And in fact, there's a, uh, another car behind that just about to come on would be Sandy Duncan. But they're bringing these officials on fairly quickly. But still, the slouch hats are on the track and the cars, in fact, could almost drive right over the top of them. <laughs> yes. so I was just noticing here that the brim was originally looped up on the right side, and I'd say, to enable the troops to look the inspecting officer straight in the eye when marching past. <laughs> well, if, if I don't quite know where that leads the poor man now. Well, someone's walking across now to pick up those slouch hats. Yes, they've done it. Yes. yes, very, very good. I think that should have been done. The crowd applauding that. <laughs> We'd like to see all those soldiers in, in perfect uniform, and that's been picked. They've been picked up. Just in time. And here is Sir Alexander Ross. Sir Edward Williams meeting Lady Ross. And just a few seconds behind them, Mr Mbathi of Kenya, Vice Chairman of the Commonwealth Games Federation. And Mr. Mbarty, a large from the car. To be greeted by Sir Alexander Ross. No, I'm sorry, to be greeted by Sir Edward Williams. And now, and now drawing up now, Mr. Les Martin, who's president of the Australian Commonwealth Games Association, with Mrs. Martin, again to be greeted by Sir Edward. Les Martin was the general manager of the Australian team in the Edmonton Games in 1978. Mr. K. Sandy Duncan, the OED, Honorary Secretary of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Now, Sandy Duncan, the very popular secretary of the Commonwealth Games Federation, there was no doubting uh, his origins, a, a Scotsman. He's been the secretary for a number of years and a very popular figure you know, all over the Commonwealth. Sandy Duncan. In the next car is Mr. M. B. Phillips, honorary treasurer of the Commonwealth Games. And now Mr. M. B. Phillips, who is honorary treasurer of the Commonwealth Games Foundation. Mr. Phillips. And Mrs. And the final car will carry Dr. Owen, who's the honorary medical officer of the Commonwealth Games Federation. And once they arrive, the 
The six dignitaries in order, Sir Alexander Ross, Mr. Mbarty, Les Martin, Sandy Duncan, Max Bird Phillips and Dr. Owen, in, a, in conjunction with Sir Edward Williams, will remain just beside the saluting area and they will in turn be presented to His Royal Highness on arrival. And that's a view looking down from the actual running track, looking up to this grandstand here, the permanent grandstand here at QE2. Yeah, the yeah, remaining yeah, areas are all temporary, so the dignitaries are lined up there. And as the last car goes off the track, the next arrival, of course, is His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, and he will come into the arena by open car. Remarkably stable helicopter shot, Gerald, in considering the conditions is. up there with 30 knot breezes. I wouldn't have thought it would have been very pleasant up there. Norman, the interesting thing is that all of those outer seats, I think it's 48,000 altogether, are all aluminium and are going to be shipped away, aren't they? Yes. Now here's the fanfare for the arrival of His Royal Highness. Reception, the Prime Minister and the Premier got this to be a great reception for the His Royal Highness. He's opened every games bar one since 1954, and uh, of course now it's tradition that His Royal Highness opens the games and Her Majesty the Queen closes them. We're going in front of the 6,000 school children who will be featured later on, and they'll go right round the arena in front of this vast crowd here, and they're going round almost within touching distance of those children. What a thrill for them! Oh, yes. Marvellous. Just just the sight too. Superb. And the Royal Car is entering the back straight now of the stadium. That's the far side to where we are. We're sitting on the western side. And of course those children will be they'll be featured a little bit later on in this remarkable display. We won't tell you what's going to happen later on because it's a thing that you can see without any warning of what you, what's going to happen. And I think you're going to enjoy it very, very much if you stay with this telecast. Beautiful car, Norman. You really can't see your face in it. His Royal Highness was given a great welcome to Brisbane didn't, yesterday, didn't he, when he arrived in the Royal Dock Britannia. The, a great crowd turned out to see him come in, and they're looking down from the view of the red, white, and blue colours in the foreground there of the games itself and the green and gold, of course, of the Australian team combination of those two groups of colours. And now this is the top of the stage, just approaching it and down to the Royal Air. And now we can hear the applause from the grandstand as they're halfway down the straight. Prince Philip will be greeted by Sir Alexander Ross, the President of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Sir Alexander Ross now will present the officials, that's first of all Mr Mbarthy from Kenya, then Mr Les Martin from Australia, Sir Edward Williams, Chairman of the Organising Committee, uh, Max Birds Phillips and uh, Dr. Owen, of course, Sandy Duncan is there too. So, quickly through that and uh, not wasting any time at all because it's, uh, it is a fairly cool day and now the band will play the national anthem.
21 gun salute going Booming on the background. through the stadium. and more starts hats down there that have been all told now seven of the Guard of Honor have lost their hats with no effort to pick them up or recover them. His Royal Highness now inspect the Guard of Honor. I wonder if he'll pause before one of those soldiers has lost his uh, hat make a comment to them. I think he would do that. It's been a rigid discipline. I noticed too as His Royal Highness moved across how difficult it was for the two soldiers in front carrying the standards to keep them there. That was even at that standard size it was very hard to respond. Uh, I wonder what it's going to be like for the for the standard bearers for the teams. Maybe the wind will drop a little. It's quite possible by the, by the stage we by the time we do get to the parade of teams it will have dropped a little, but Norman, there are three more hats on the ground. Yes, too. I noticed that, so that's seven in all. And all the front line are quite all right. There's no problem there. All of the hats were lost by soldiers from the second line. And that's them. Yeah, that's true. And they're playing yes. um, a whole selection of popular songs here from the band to just to speed things up. As the His Royal Highness not wasting any time because it's. Um, I think that he, he understands that they want to get on with the, the job. And as I said before, that we have a, a parade coming up, a whole fanfare of everything and things like that which the ABC was very closely involved. It was a, a competition to select the, the, be, the best they could do for a parade of 45 minutes before the opening ceremony. And the ABC won that honour in, in front of seven other contestants, or six other contestants, or seven in all. And um, it's really great. Uh, we, we can't say what it is because oh, it's worth seeing. It's, it's mind-boggling, the logistics, which we'll talk about later, the logistics involved, 6,500 children. Now, let's see what happens here. His Royal Highness going along, and he's just passed one of the young men who's lost his hat. That's the second one, the third, fourth, and fifth. Three there to go. There must be a sudden gust of wind now. He's going through the whole process very quickly. Incidentally, the musical director of the games is Major Colin Harper, who uh, was based in Perth for many years and is now based in Brisbane. The musical director of the first military district band in Brisbane. His Royal Highness will also inspect the band. It's amazing the impact music can have, isn't it, Norman? Because even before the uh, official ceremony began, when the uh, Navy band played Angers Away, the crowd immediately began to clap furiously. Well, if they clap the music they've heard so far, they're going to really clap when they hear the music yes. that's to come. They and certainly we, are. So that ends the inspection of the Guard of Honour and the band by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, and he will go now to the Royal Box, and uh, very soon now they'll be starting this magnificent display, which goes for around the 40, 45 minutes. And they have problems here today, don't they? Because this, huge, this tremendous wind is going to affect certain parts of this display, and as they come along, uh, we won't try and anticipate what's going to happen. They're hoping they can get the whole display through, but there are certain aspects of it which I would be really in trouble, and I think we'll just leave it to just before the schedule time just to see what happens. Uh, yes, I believe they are. About a minute before, they're going to decide whether some aspects of it go ahead. I do hope they do, but... I wouldn't like with the people involved. The Prince really seems to enjoy these ceremonies, although he must have attended so many over the years. Well, of all the things he does, the Commonwealth Games is really relaxed. They go right round all the venues, they just drop into them one after the other. They will leave in a minimum of official them like this. This is the only official part, the opening and closing ceremony. And uh, the events go on and all of a sudden they just stop and in walk members of the Royal Family, stay for three, three quarters of an hour, then go to another one. and they're relaxed and friendly, there's no protocol in the venues, and there we are, we have His Royal Highness, Sir Alexander Ross, and just away to the left, the Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Fraser. Who we have to say does dwarf the Prince, the Prime Minister is such a big man. There's Martin just walking through. 
Commonwealth Games Federation. And now here's the view looking down from high in the grandstand of the Guard of Honour and in the background the band. Now we're waiting. We're waiting for the display to begin, which is a 40-minute display performed to a pre-recorded soundtrack played by the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. The vocals are sung by the Sydney Philharmonia Choir, and Tommy Tacho conducted and arranged the music. And this is not a sporting display. This is a, a display intended to show us the full breadth of Australia's cultural and social links. But first, the departure of the Guard of Honour, and here's the applause from the capacity crowd here at Kiwi 3 Stadium at 60,000. I believe there were 100,000 seats available this morning, and, and they sold by 8 o'clock. Oh. And the mascot is uh, almost in step this time. That's a great performance by them, they look splendid. I did mention before that tremendous arm action, the arm swing by those soldiers, to bring the arms right up to the shoulder high and back well behind them. It's not that easy, you know, to march in correct position with a straight back and perfectly erect, but then they can do it. And here they are leaving the scene here and behind them the band. And so far, everything is running very smoothly, and I would say everything running almost exactly the schedule. Yes, I'd say so. And Norman, I made a terrible mistake. It's poor Mr. Tommy Tico, not Tommy Tycho. To... Geraldine, you're, you're a Western Australian lady. Yes, he I know. Tommy I will have Sydney. to put it down to that. My apologies, Mr. Tico. Listen to the crowd now. And here we are, 6,074 school children from Brisbane between the ages of 12 and 15 are about to move into position for this display. And one thing I'm very, very pleased about today is the temperature has dropped because on the rehearsal day, one day earlier here this week, it was 34 degrees and those children, 6,000, will be held out in this arena for several hours and we had fears that, um, you know, that there might be some passing out and things like that, but the temperature today about 21 degrees. It takes them a few minutes to move into position, but 21 degrees is just cool enough. I hope the wind doesn't affect them out there, but it's a much more pleasant situation than it was during the rehearsal. keep their caps on the feet of this wind. <laughs> and notice that colour, red, white and blue, the colours of the games. Now, each I'm afraid one, each, several hats are coming off. Yes, but each one of these children are so carefully rehearsed, they're all going to move into a pre-prescribed position. months and months of rehearsal. They come from a number of schools in Brisbane. I think, we had I think there are 38 secondary schools in Brisbane. 
and there were 250 teachers involved who volunteered to take the classes at their individual schools. The logistics are absolutely mind-boggling. Apparently, they even had to go to the detail of ordering tracksuits earlier in the year and allowing for a child's growth by the time they would wear them now in October. I think they began rehearsals in May, but they've only actually had six massed rehearsals. And when you see it, it, it is quite an amazing feat to think that they've achieved something so complex. Slowly the pattern begins to form, and I'd say that now about one third of them are in position, and still about 4,000 to go. I, I don't think it um, worries that this takes just a few minutes to marshal them because it's absolutely fascinating watching them. And the crowd are, are absorbed by this as these children, they, they, nobody knows what they're going to do. And this is the soundtrack we talked about in the background which goes non-stop through the 40 odd minutes of this display and the children are going to work on cue from the music. I think we should make that point. It's all done by cues and it's all been rehearsed and there's no signal or instruction given to them. And here they are forming up in, into their positions and we'll just leave it to children to tell you their story. Norman, the display was worked out, I was told, on a scale model of the stadium and seven millimetre square magnets were used to represent each individual child. The magnets moved around the table and their position was recorded. And after about... performance and look at the Duke of Edinburgh who thinks that's absolutely brilliant.
And from the left-hand side, the third lifesavers of Queensland. Here are the marching bells. We have uh, hundreds of those. Queensland, of course, the Sunshine State with their 48 surplus. And I've asked behind the colour party that great March Pass team, Bundaberg, who over the last 25 years have won the Australian March Pass Championship probably 12 or 13 times. One of the great March Pass teams of Australia. Teams from the Sunshine Coast, the Gold Coast. We also have teams from uh, over the border in New South Wales, even from Freshwater in Sydney, New South Wales. But these teams, and with the marching girls, will parade in front of the Royal Dais. And they do this to precision, and in rehearsal, the lifesavers were 30 seconds too slow. <laughs> Is that right? Norman, you were something of a lifesaver yourself, weren't you? Yes, my club's marching here today, fresh water, coming up from Sydney, yes. There are about 500... Um, marching girls and the lifesavers, I should think, this is the 75th anniversary of the, of the surf clubs, and um, there'll be about uh, 28 to 30 clubs represented here. Notice the women lifesavers are there as well as the men. This is an important thing. In the last couple of years, that women have been included as full members of the surf clubs, and of course the lifesavers, tremendously popular in Queensland, patrolling those great beaches. There's miles and miles of these days, we talk in kilometres of coastline, a voluntary organisation there, Southport, one of the great clubs in the Gulf Coast. And of course, in the middle, while this is going on, the children, the 6,000 of them, are remarshalling for new formations. And this has just taken the interest away from just a moment or two. And the lifesavers are coming down the main straightaway, marching out the other end, and the marching girls are going in the opposite direction, marching up the north end. And Norman, you were explaining to me that the lifesavers march, is it a bent knee march, or whatever yes. you were telling me? Yes, it is. Because, because they march in the sand. They march on the sand, and it's a traditional march, and of course they're carrying the surf reel, which is well known to us here in Australia. In Australia, in fact, there are over 250 clubs, but they say that Queensland, with its uh, sunshine all the year round, and they can swim all the year round, is in fact the home of Australian surfing. It's a proud boast, and I think it's a reasonable one as well. Pleasing point, Geraldine, I think the wind is dropping because those standards will be very hard to hold uh, down there and it may well be the wind is blowing very strongly up on top of the grandstand but reasonably well, or not so strong, down on the uh, ground level. Now the last team has entered the arena for the lifesavers and the end of the marching girls are just turning around to go out in about uh, a minute or two, they'll be in position. And I notice down there, as you can't, you can't see from just at the moment, with the freshwater team, this last to come on. And here's my old club. Now, were you a, am I right or wrong that you were actually a champion for, the, for your club? I was a sprint swimmer who went at slow speed. <laughs> <laughs> How humble of you. During the rehearsals, it amused me uh, that some of the Canadians came down to us and said, Norman, what do you call those cables that the lifesavers are carrying? I don't suppose they know anything about lifesavers on beaches. And over there on the other side of the choir, of course, this is a, a sound track that goes right through the 40 minutes, and uh, here it is, the lifesavers going past, and here's the new symbol. Red, white and blue of the games, and the last team to come through is the Freshwater Club of New South Wales. And that ends this parade by the marching girls and the lifesavers who are just about to come off the arena. And of course, the people of Queensland who understand At this point what lifesavers are all about are very happy. Unfortunately, in the present unfavourable weather conditions, this jump could not be made in safety, and we've decided not to proceed with the parachutists as part of the display. Would all school children stand by now for the music following the skydivers? Well, I don't blame them for doing that, Geraldine, because it was a very dangerous op operation under the wind conditions. The skydivers told us they could, they could jump 
at the 15 knot breezes, maybe 20 at the outside. But with 30 knot breezes, it was too dangerous, not only where they'd come down, but even a skydiver landing amongst the children could have been dangerous because they dropped the last 14 feet of free fall, and that uh, a 13 stone person uh, dropping on a, a 7 stone child is not very much, <laughs> not very exciting prospect, is it? No, no, but I, I think it would have been very foolish to say the very least. Well, now we're going to have the dance segment, and first of all, the Australian Aboriginals are out there in the middle of the arena. Now, this is the first of 17 dance segments of which one of the Australian Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, and followed by 15 ethnic groups. and it's owned by those of the clan whose totem is the butterfly. And now the Torres Strait Islanders. different ethnic groups in Australia and now briefly we're going to see 15 amateur groups from Brisbane and first of all the Yugoslav community with their dance group and this is a traditional dance called the Hura.
Scotland now, the Irish. 32 girls dancing in this group, performing traditional Irish steps called the Chaley Steps. Italian group, in addition to these dancers, also perform Russian, Polish and Hungarian traditional dances. But this one, the Tarantella, is regarded as a purely Italian dance. Fantastic, the Tarantella, and now the Polynesian group, consisting of dancers from Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, and others, and they're performing the traditional tamure. side of the world and this is the German folk dance group Alpen Rose from the Brisbane German Club which will be celebrating its 100th anniversary in 1983. The Merry Woodchopper, the Bavarian figure dancing. dancing group performing one verse of Sevillanos, which is the traditional dance of Seville, and they're mostly school children, incidentally. of the Queensland Dance Group. This company was only formed in 1980.
that's possibly the favourite of the lot, the Tinnikling from the Philippines. But now the Scottish dancers, Scottish ballroom dancing, performed by the South East Queensland branch of the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society. Games will be held in Edinburgh, Scotland. a Latin American dancing group were formed in early 1981 and their first appearance wasn't until July 1981 since then they've performed very regularly in Brisbane Lankan dance specially choreographed for the opening ceremony, and the costume and headdress are part of the traditional attire. This particular costume was designed in Brisbane, especially for these games. Folkloric Ensemble of Brisbane, the Obertus, only formed in March 1982, performing the Krakowiak, possibly the best known national dance of Poland. Welcome to our friends from the Greek community, where we talk of Commonwealth and Olympic Games, there's where it all began hundreds and hundreds of years ago.
The Hungarian group, who started dancing here 12 years ago, performing a short version of the Hungarian Tsardas. Ukrainian group comprising most of the young couples from Brisbane, and these are the last of the 17 dance groups to appear in this display. magnificent performance by all those dancing groups, a spectacular part of the ceremony, and now here at Huey 2 Stadium in Brisbane, we await the arrival of the first lady of the Brisbane Games, and she's soon to appear. You don't mean the Queen, do you? No, she comes later on. The Queen will close <laughs> the Games, the Duke opens them, but you're going to get a pleasant surprise here. And we're looking down, and here is the, the tune. I think you all recognise this one. Stadium, the First Lady, Matilda, and 
have a look at this. This is absolutely magnificent. Look at, there she is down in the middle of the picture now. The dancers are leaving, but Matilda is coming out onto the track. There she is in the background. That's Matilda. <laughs> and look at her. And just watch for the blinking eye, too. It's fabulous. Winking at the crowd right now. Incidentally, just to uh, get down to tin tax, is actually a very heavy-duty industrial forklift truck, which has uh, been stripped out and adapted to suit Matilda's need. She has a driver, a mechanic, and two special effects operators. She weighs about six tons, incidentally. She's 13 metres high, and her waist measurement is five metres, poor lady. The distance from her front paws to her tail is nine metres. I think she's inspired. I think it is another week is brewing, I suspect. <laughs> and here they are, just the young Matildas to come out, the tiny trampolinas, the trampolines have been placed in position. And down in front of us here, Rolf Harris has just arrived, and here are the trampolinas. Little Joey's. I think we've been told to call them. The Trampolinus is there from the Trampoline Association. And here's Ralph Harris just entering the stadium. and I think they've slayed them. Oh, I think so. Oh, I think Matilda is, is superb. I had no idea she was coming onto the track last time. It absolutely blew my mind. Can I welcome you to the games, friends? Welcome you to the games. Look, I don't know all of your names, friends, but let me welcome you all to the games. All together that tiny kangaroo down sport. Tiny kangaroo down. Tiny kangaroo down sport. Tiny kangaroo down. Let's hear you. Tiny kangaroo down sport. Tiny kangaroo down. Tiny kangaroo down sport. Tiny kangaroo. Tiny kangaroo down sport. says Australia. Once a jolly swagman can't buy a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree and he sang as he watched and he waited till his billy boy Matilda with me Down came a jumbo, 
to drink at the billabong. Up jumped the swag man and grabbed him with glee. And he sang as he stole that jump up in his tucker bag. You come on the wall, see the two. Wait for the key change. scheduled to start at 3.35 and it's exactly that now and Sir Alexander Ross very very happy on being on the left hand side of his Royal Highness and further across to the Prime Minister but now the Parade of Nations and this will be a spectacular parade which will run again for about 45 minutes by tradition the host country the last names Canada will lead the parade and it will be closed by the host team Australia But we'll just leave it to the crowd here to express their appreciation of these 6,074 Brisbane school children between the ages of 12 and 15. inside the arena, so if this beautiful view here of a 60,000 sellout means the crowd here actually is 66,000 and with 2,000 athletes to come on. Extraordinary, Norman. It's a marvellous sight at the moment. Everybody is so much more excited than they were even at the start.
said, John, it's only appropriate that you give credit where credit is due to the ABC team responsible for that magnificent display. Of course, the executive producer, uh, Rick Birch, uh, worked on programs such as Four Corners and a tremendous effort by a small team of only about six of them. And they've been going on this for months. In fact, it's delaying them all. I actually can't manage to think of how they devised it, Norman. I think it's, it's quite extraordinary to imagine the, the imagination, first of all, and then the skill to bring it off. Well, the team were Rick Birch, first of all, the executive producer. Um, Karen Friedrich, Richards. Yes, Astrid Friedrich, Fiona Watts, Karen Richards, uh, Kate Woods, Kate Woods, who used to work for us in sporting, uh, Adrian Simons, and also uh, a small production team with them as well. But a magnificent performance by them, and full credit, because that was really a great display, and I've seen them all from... I go back a long way from Perth in 62, from, to Moscow in 1980, and that equals anything I've seen, even Moscow. I think the thing that was so fantastic was that they involved children, so many children. What a memorable occasion for them to have been involved in something like that. Well, they're not going to be instead of going, hand. Instead of going for professionals, they went for, for the children of Australia. I think they should be commended. Now, all of the teams are assembled out in the area away to the left. That's the marshalling area there. And we expect about 45 or 46 teams to march in this parade. And the highest number ever to march uh, is 46 at Edmonton in 1978. Now, I understand there's a, a drop out of the Cook Islands, unfortunately, because of their bowling team not being qualified. And also, I believe that Sierra Leone, ha hasn't, Sierra Leone hasn't arrived, and that would have meant 47. I think maybe we're going to get to about 45 which would certainly be a record for the Southern Hemisphere. Robert, can you explain to me whether there is some sort of qualifying... Norman, is there some sort of qualifying uh, qualifying skill required before you can actually come to the Games, or can you can just submit well, any athlete? every country can nominate a team, and I believe that their national champions would be accepted, but for events which you can measure by time or distance, there is a qualifying standard but I believe that every country in the Commonwealth is entitled to send their national champion if they want to. And that's what they do, and only one or two in some cases, very small places, send even one competitor, two competitors, half a dozen competitors, just to be represented here, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we had a drop out of um, oh, six or seven uh, third world countries because of lack of money, and that's just one of those things, they can't do it. But um, apart from that, I think just about everybody is here. It's a tremendous roll-up. And, and what a tribute it is that with um, all the troubles we've had in getting these games going, that they're all here and all here so happily. Certainly seem to be. It's a sad thing that it has become so expensive, though, because it would be great to see as many as could possibly turn up. Well, His Royal Highness, accompanied by Sir Alexander Ross, is moving down to the saluting dais, which is just in front of the running track. That's about two-thirds of the way down the running track, and they're right in front of the middle of this grandstand here. And, of course, this is the permanent grandstand. You made the point before, Geraldine, that most of the seating here is temporary. It's the aluminium for about 48,000 seats. And the reason for that is, of course, that this stadium uh, will probably not be used for an event like this ever in the future, and um, it will be very, very useful for many, many sports and sporting events, which would hold crowds of, say, 10 to 20,000. But here's the arrival of the mass bands, and this is the largest services band ever to perform in Australia, and a beauty of this band, it represents the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, and because of that, the colours are red, white, and blue, and I should think that um, after Ron Paris, this would be a pretty popular song. 240 of them, a record easy in size, and I believe it's going to be a record in total performance. They're going to go straight through non-stop right to the end of the break. And while the band comes on, perhaps we should talk about the games and how it's made up. There are ten sports in the Commonwealth Games, of which two are compulsory. There are athletics, such as track and field, and swimming, which includes diving, but the remaining eight sports are selected by the host country. Now, for Brisbane 1982, the ten sports are athletics, swimming, then archery, which is being held for the first time, badminton, boxing, cycling, lawn bowls, shooting, weightlifting, and wrestling. Other sports used in the past, but not in these games, have been fencing, gymnastics and rowing. Now, I understand that rowing will be introduced 
for the next games in 1986. Now, just briefly in the background there, you get a glimpse of the Canadian team, which by tradition, the host country of the 1978 games will lead the parade. And we can just get a glimpse of the standard bearer there. It's John Primrose. He's the famous gold medal trap shooter from 74 and 78, a world champion in 1975, and he, of course, has stayed in Australia in 1962. We'll pick him up a little bit later on because we want to get the, the athletes right round to the top of the straight where they get into the saluting position in front of His Royal Highness. And of course, now we see the view now of this band coming round to the back straight here, this great stadium. And the thing about this stadium is I've never seen a stadium with so much colour. Oh! It's marvellous. It's, it's superb. And with the stylized or the leftovers of where the children were sitting with the stylized kangaroo, which is the logo, and the superb... What is this surface, actually, Norman? It's a, a synthetic track, yes, isn't it? Yes, a very latest synthetic track. And these games, of course, are part of the technology of doing things, which we've gone from grass in 1950 to cinders in 1950, in the late 50s, and here's His Royal Highness behind him, Sir Edward Williams, it is, the chairman of the organising committee. And perhaps while they come down the back straight, we might just mention something about the ticket sales for these games. There seemed to be a lot of misconception around Australia. These games were not popular, that people from overseas countries weren't here. Well, I can report that they're a record for any games in history. They've just passed the six and a quarter million dollar mark in sales, and they'll finish well in excess of the estimate of six million, and tickets are being sold at the rate of 60,000 a day. And as we said, this opening ceremony now is a sellout. After those tickets went this morning, those last thousand by eight o'clock, and this stadium, by the way, is 50% bigger than any other main stadium that I can remember. Edmonton, four years ago, held 42,000. Perth, in 1962, held 42,000. Um, Edinburgh was 28,000. Um, Kingston, Jamaica, was 35,000. So, in a stadium 50% bigger, um, they're going to get an average daily crowd here of, say, 45,000, which will break all records. The other big days, of course, are Monday, where Raylene boils in the 400 metres. That's a feature event. And Thursday the 7th, that's next Thursday, where the men's 800 is on, and they were thought that Sebastian Coe and Steve Odette would be racing, but both were through for injury. And the fact about it is that both Steve Odette and Sebastian Coe are here as commentators. Strange is thing. that yeah, right? That's right, yes. For the BBC? Yeah. Now, tickets will remain on sale during the Games, and the officials, as I said, are a tradition is average daily attendance, which will break all previous records. And oddly, oddly, the majority of tickets still available are the cheaper ones. So at other venues, the swimming at Channel has been sold out for months at all sessions. There are virtual sellouts for the semi-finals and finals of cycling and boxing and all the sessions of weightlifting. So the people of Brisbane, whether or not there are visitors from overseas, the local people here have just gone crazy about these things. It seems to have infected all of Brisbane. The whole place just seems to be really thrilled by the prospect of having all these athletes here. Now, what's this, Geraldine? Now, here are the four sections of the band in the red, white and blue of the Army the Navy and the Air Force, and they will form up into what is the game symbol. Norman, just one thing you haven't mentioned that I was very interested in, that the host nation can put on two demonstration sports, and apparently we've chosen football and table tennis, and in fact this Wednesday, I understand, they're going to have a replay of the VFL Grand Final. Richmond and, uh, and Carlton are going to play. Yes, and there's a uh, rugby union match at Ballymore, and all of these things going in conjunction with the games. And now there's the symbol of the games with that magnificent band, 240 pieces, the blue of the Air Force, the white of the Navy, and the red of the Army. Red, white, and blue, and here's the flag for Canada. The maple leaf forever, and carrying that flag is a great athlete, John Primrose, gold medalist for the trap shoot, 74-78, a world champion. And behind him, 244 members of this Canadian team. And Steve, John Primrose, by the way, as I said before, lived in Australia in the 60s for about nine months. Um, he's from the University of Alberta. He's studying for a degree there and one of the finest shooters in the world. And what a tribute for him to see him lead this parade. And the Canadian girls, look at them, in red and the Canadian men in all white. They look fabulous, don't they? Norman, how big was their contingent in Edmonton? Now, a little bit bigger than this because the host nation, by tradition, always enters a competitor in every event. But the whole story of Edmonton four years ago was a vast improvement in standard of the Canadians. They won 45 gold medals, which is a record for any country in the Games. And it was brought about by a huge government support scheme. In the mid-70s, they spent 20 million on sport compared to Australia's 1 million. 
It was really a political exercise to get the Canadian community united behind Canada. They had their big problems over there with the French and English people, people with Quebec Libre breaking away, and they used sport to bring the country together because Canada does not have national cricket teams, it does not have national football teams or anything like that. The only national team is the ice hockey team, and those games were used to bring the whole of Canada, Canada whether English or French speaking, as one unit, and they were successful because they held the games, the Olympic Games, in a French speaking area in Montreal in 76, and then to Alberta, a British speaking area, in 1978. And look at this Canadian team, they're very, very confident, and they have two world champions here in swimming, Steve Davis and Alec Bowman, and I think the whole highlight of these games is going to be the clash between Australia and Canada in swimming. What a moment for them. I like the look of that, Geraldine. They look, they look very, very smart. And a change of colour to the West Indies now. The Bahamas, a team of only 13. Steve Hanna, the long jumper, is the standard bearer. Bahamas just coming past this living dais. The first of many from the West Indies that will meet. An amazing number of sportsmen they turn out from such a small area of the globe, Norman. Well, you see behind them, uh, behind the Bahamas, you'll see a, a little place called Barbados. <laughs> little, uh, there it is, Barbados. And uh, June Cadill, the hurdler, uh, the first woman to carry the standard here today. And of course, Barbados is over there in the West Indies. And behind the Bermuda, well, I think the Bermuda team, they will, as they always do, march in Bermuda shorts. Uh, not much of a day for novelty knees. <laughs> and, of course, Bermuda off the east Bermuda. coast of the United States. Now, the, only seven in that team. Bermuda's the honeymoon capital, I'm told, Norman. Now, Botswana, the first of the African countries, a team of 19 here, and Pius Kenyon, the sprinter, is one of the team. He's carrying the standard of 12 bowlers and seven athletes in this team. And Botswana, of course, um, one of the whole group of African nations. And isn't it great to see them here after all the troubles we've had leading up to these games? It certainly is. It certainly is. I understand, Norman, that they're in fact... Ah, the Cayman well, Islands, Cayman Islands we a team of two only. And in fact, here we have um, David Bond, as the youngest ever 10,000 metre runner. He's only 16, and of course the other man's a marathon runner, Nick Akers. Interesting point, Geraldine. The Cayman Islands are 26 miles at the widest point, and that's the almost the exact marathon distance. Well, I said they have a female official there. She was a ring in that one. They said there was only two on the team. <laughs> now, Cyprus, that's a very interesting team of 19 here. Now, we've got the quiet tip. And a lot of the Greek national team are in this Cyprus team, and they're a bit better than a lot of people thought. There are 14, including one female long jumper, and uh, there they are, walking past this ceremonial dais on the left, Sir Alexander Ross, his Royal Highness in the middle, and Sir Edward Williams on the right-hand side. And now we're waiting for England, I think, which will come up behind the Cyprus team. And of course, the great country of the Commonwealth Games, England and Australia, rivals for year after year. England's won five times, Australia five times, and Canada once. And Phil Hubble, the silver medalist in 200 metres butterfly in Moscow, is holding the standard. And the English girls, they've got some great swimmers there, Jim Croft, Jackie Wilmot, and they're going to create a lot of problems for Australia, particularly for Tracy Wickham. But the English team, I'd say, I'd say don't write them off. of course, will be represented in all sports, and um, there's been a tendency in publicity to make this game a contest between Australia and Canada, but I say, don't write off this English team. In fact, right 
Andrew Edmonton, it really was. The Commonwealth Games really was a contest between Australia and England, wasn't it? And then Edmonton yes, changed all that. Right? It's, now, it's now really a three-way contest between Australia, England and Canada. And the here they are, the Falkland Islands, the shooting team. Well, the two shooters are there. Now, let's see. I think I've got their names here somewhere. Yes, Tony Patterson, the shooter, and Jared Cheer. And we were saying that earlier on during the week they might have had plenty of practice for these games. Well, I wasn't going to say that, North. But, 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 but on the other hand, Jeremy, they may have been targets. And they're getting a tremendous applause from the crowd here. That was the announcement of the Falkland Islands team. What a moment for them. Their small country torn by war just a couple of months ago. And here they are. And the crowd are rising and cheering. And the crowd are really coming out with enthusiasm. They're bubbling over here. And here's the team from Fiji. Uh, and our Northern Pacific neighbours from the Pacific Islands, the Fijian team, they've been coming to these games for quite a long time. That's the Bulla Bulla shirt, that one. Is it? Yes, that's the Bulla shirt. That's the Fijian sign of welcome. They say Bulla Bulla, and that is the actual traditional shirt. Now, let's see the size. 52. Quake Reddick, the weight. That's a big it. team for a country the size of Fiji. Well, but the beauty of it is it's not so far away these days. It's only one hop on an aircraft, and it's great to see Fiji be represented in such numbers. Because they're great, they're great rugby players, aren't they, Norman? Tremendous. Now, the Gambia are one of the African countries. Um, they have 12 members in the team. 12 members, and they're all sprinters. That's an amazing thing. They, they, they only compete in one event, one, that's track and field, but only in one class of one event, and they all run in the sprint races. You were making the comment earlier, it's a pity, Norman, for all the pleasure and all the athletic prowess that the black Africans bring to the games that they've never yet been able to mount their own games. I hope that does happen in the near future, say in the next 20 years or so, because they're going to be the deserve one. Now, here's Ghana. Now, Ghana is a team traditionally strong in athletics and also in boxing. We always find a man from Ghana in one of the boxing contests, because most of the sports, of course, are available to men and women, and there are certain sports where it's men only. It's a bit in boxing, of course, one of the macho sports, Geraldine. Uh, yes, it is, Norman. I won't look at the <laughs> fabulous costumes. Don't they look superb? Ghana, of course, is virtually built on gold, Norman. Very wealthy country under Not the ground, base, anyway. Though. Not a bad base to build something on. And look at that crowd. They're, they're really enthusiastic. They're and the competitors too. This, what a moment for them. Well, Gibraltar, this is an Gibraltar, interesting one. Country built now, on the rock. A team of four. Now, the swimmer, Ian Martinez, actually trains in the Mediterranean. There's no swimming pool there. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he trains out amongst the U-boats that are sunk there. <laughs> I'm sure that bears no relation to the facts. But... behind the, the Channel, Channel Islands. Now, now Matthew Gill's a shooter. And one of the team members they have here is, is an old fella called Charlie Trotter, and he's going to compete in a wheelchair. He won the Queen's Prize back in 1976. He's not actually marching, but we've had a little tip. There's going to be a wheelchair athlete actually marching or, or taking part in this opening ceremony. It's going to be later on for New Zealand. Yes, indeed she is. Yes, sir. Now, this is Guyana. And this is the, the one, one country which is on the mainland of South America, which is a very interesting thing. It's part of the West Indies group, of course. And the standard bearer there was Mark Yaw, who's a 21-year-old boxer. That's a beautiful uniform, isn't it? Oh, stunning colour. Now, Hong Kong, George Sousa, the lawn bowler, is the standard bearer here. Hong Kong, you wouldn't think much of their sporting prowess, but they have a record of winning the lawn bowls fours twice in the last three games, so they're very, very good. Yes, they've featured on Jack High many times, as I recall. And Hong Kong, of course, really a pretty big team of 34. And as we said about Fiji, that Hong Kong have got a big team because of the proximity to Australia. And also you'll find the same thing with the next team, which is India. And look at the Indian turbans. Now, wait till you see this. Now, uh, these Indians look absolutely magnificent. Uh, look at that colour. <laughs> 53 in the team. Rajinder Singh, the gold medal wrestler, is a standard bearer. But that's a sort of... What would you call that, John? Ice blue? Well, I would. I've just tried to work out a good, good description for it. Yes, it is ice blue. Glorious colour. So the Indian team march through their number 16 in the parade. What are their main sports, Norman? When they oh, very good in wrestling. They have they produce some very good middle distance runners as well, and things like um, you know weightlifting, maybe boxing. 
huge population, but very little opportunities here, of course. But here's one. Now, what's the story here, Jody? Perhaps you can tell us. <laughs> uh, Peter Kelly is the uh, standard bearer for the Isle of Man again. Apparently, a Kelly always carries the standard for you the Isle of Man. You know why? You know the song? I uh, don't. Has anybody here seen Kelly? Kelly from the Isle of Man. And that's it. That's the reason. But the, the thing is, they've won a gold medal in the Commonwealth Games, but he wasn't named Kelly. His name was Buckley, and he did that in 1966 in the road race. That wasn't very civic of him, was it? So a team of 35 from the Isle of Man, so they're not doing too bad. Must be the whole of the Isle of Man. Now, now coming up next is Jamaica, and I think the man who would go down as the great athlete of these games. He's not carrying the standard. The standard's been carried by David Weller, a cyclist, and in that 21-member team. It's a chap called Don Quarry. He's won the gold medal for the 100 metres, a classic event for the last three games, 1970, 1974 and 1978. He may not be marching, I can't see him out there, but Don Quarry must be the number one athlete of these games, a tremendous performer. He's really legendary, isn't oh, he, Don if he, can, if he can do it four times in a row, what can you say about that? A cyclist who's aged 17. Right? 17 members in the 17 team. 17 members in the team, pardon me. Jersey's really a more, more French than English, even though it is uh, a Channel Island. Now, here's the biggest African team. This is Kenya. The standard bearer is James Maynard, a very famous 800 metre runner. Now, here's the map of Kenya, of course, uh, Nairobi's the capital over there. Look, look what happened to Henry Rona, the world champion, he just disappeared. It's a great pity. I was very much looking forward to see. He's just uh, vanished, has he? We don't quite know where he is. Well, we found out that he wasn't coming on Sunday, but it's a pity. But a pity. Um, you'll find that this team will produce some good runners. They're, they're a very, very solid team. And I believe they, they have a tendency to produce runners that nobody's ever heard of before and who can disappear after one game. They just natural runners. Yes, in 1966, Ron Clark was about 100 to 1 on to win. And a little fella called Timu beat him by about half a lap. Over, over six miles, it was amazing. But uh, they produced him. Now, Malawi, another African country. Of course, we pick up where Malawi is. Small. And we have an army major here, Gibson Madunga, a shooter, who's leading this team of 16. coming up next. I think they're there. No, Mal Malta, we can't see them. It looks like Malaysia. Ah, Malaysia. We had Malta on the list. Uh, Malaysia, that's what one scratching. Them? Only a team of seven from Malaysia. This one, the most beautiful flags there, isn't, isn't it? stunning? One of our very near neighbours, Malaysia. Sent many, many students to Australia. Made great friends with Australians. I think they're and out of no? sequence here. Malta's coming next. Um, I'd say Malawi. I would say that Malta should come after Malaysia. Oh, we're right there. No, no, no. They're, they're right. right. They're Malaysia. right. We're wrong. <laughs> so here's Malta, the... Malta, the island that won the George Cross, with a team of 11. And behind them, Mauritius, another of the small countries. Mauritius, of course, over in, in the Indian Ocean, off the coast of Africa. And behind this team, we have them what has become the controversial team of these games and here we are New Zealand New Zealand Robin Tate um, discus thrower competing in his six games New Zealand of course a very big team of 156 but the news of the New Zealand team getting a big welcome but um, there are doubts about their future in these games and doubts about the future of the whole games after the association between New Zealand and South Africa and Rugby Union but um, the news is I think that this games association are doing the right thing by forming a code of behaviour. Let's close the ranks internally and let's get to a code of behaviour which determines what they're going to do in the future, form the rules and stick to them. Now I believe that they are, let's see if she, I can't see her there, that they um, said there's going to be a... a looking for her now, Merrily Fairhall. She's a, uh, a paraplegic girl who's going to compete in archery and there she is, Merrily Fairhall. She 
apparently uh, had a motorcycle accident in 1969, which unfortunately left her a paraplegic. She's been competing in archery for New Zealand for the past six years, and she's competed for the past three years in Australia for the Australian Championships. Now back to Nigeria. And of course, Nigeria is one of the African countries, a very strong one too. I, I think they would have those blazers at, at uh, the Henry Regatta, wouldn't they, Gerald? And look at them, those, the old style. The My goodness, yes. Vertical stripes. Green and white stripes, don't they look swell. I think some of our commentators like Dream Walk would look, look nice in one of those, wouldn't they? <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> Nigeria, I think, is the country, uh, Norman, that has appointed a Bulgarian coach to coach them in their wrestling. And they're, and they're yes. boxing. Now, Northern Ireland, uh, we're delighted to see them here. I always feel a bit of a tinge of sadness when I see this team because they, they received their medals to the London area, which is a sad song, they're a strife-torn country, but they're here in full force and they proudly come down the straight as they do in every game. Look at the uniform of the girls, isn't that beautiful in contrast to the green and, and grey of the men? Yes, that's a very smart uniform, very smart uniform with a, with a, a jerkin and a skirt. That's a big team, Norman, 74. Yes, that's a good team. It is a very big team. Well, it's a front panel. That's most attractive. There's Northern Ireland, the, the, the greatest athlete was Mary Peters, who's out here, by the way, as a, a BBC commentator. Just down in front of us here, we can see her, Mary looking across with the BBC radio team, and um, she was a magnificent performer in these games, and of course that's where I heard the London Mary Air, and she was receiving her gold medals. I see. Now here it is, our northern neighbours, partner in New Guinea, and look at this uniform, this is it, really spectacular once again, a complete contrast to the Northern Ireland team. How would you describe that? Well, I'm just trying to... I'm not very good at descriptions, you know, Norman, I always find that I can write it better than I can actually say it, but it's a real collection of colours in an over-jacket. See, Papua New Guinea sending a pretty big team too, and of course, it was a short trip, 55, that's as, as many as I think they've ever had of these games, and good luck to them. Oh, they're again great rugby players, aren't they? That's St. Helena. Now, here's, here's an interesting one, St. Helena, we'll show you where this is. Now, this is a very interesting one. The standard is being carried by a youngster called Gavin Knight. He's a swimmer, the 100 metres and 200 metres, and he's never in his life swum in a 50 metre pool, and the first time for him is here in Brisbane. Best of luck. Well, coming up next, uh, I think uh, my favourite team. Here they are, Scotland the Brave. Host city of the games in 1970, they'll be there again in 1986. And Geraldine, whatever you do, if you can get to those games in 1986, I suggest you go. Well, uh, look, I will try hard. I know you have great memories of this 1970 Edinburgh Games, don't you? Here they are, the wee lassies. Coming through, and magnificent it was. It's, that, that was the greatest games of all the ten I've been to, purely because of their great sincerity. Australia did brilliantly, winning 36 gold medals, but the Scots, if you, anybody tell you a Scotsman's mean, just ignore them. <laughs> Will you know come back again? Norman, Look. you were saying to me that actually prior to those games, the Commonwealth Games had been looking a little sick, and they revived them tremendously because yes, of the sheer did. enthusiasm that everybody the, displayed. The 1966 games in Kingston, they were saying these would be the last Empire Games they've in those days. And we went to Edinburgh in 1970, and they were televised all over the British Isles by the BBC, and they just gained and gained and gained in momentum, and they've never looked back. And now Singapore, Norman, the place we've all been. Now, talking about Singapore, let's see who we've got there. Um, a team of seven. A team of seven only. They're a bit like Hong Kong these days, their favourite sports counting money, isn't it? They've got so much of it. <laughs> and Solomon Islands. Okay, the Solomon Islands, is it? Yes, in the back and, we can show you. And their flag carrier, Jay Makuna, who's a bantamweight boxer. And they have a team of seven, too. Blue seems to be very much the colour of the day, Norman. I'm just counting the number of teams that have got blue in them. There are about eight. Well, looking back up, you see a gold flag behind the blue. Now, this is a very interesting one. This is um, Sri Lanka, and this young man... He's only aged 14 and he's having trouble holding this flag up and his name is Yudashika. You just see him the moment he comes past. There he is now. And that's a magnificent flag. That's a flag. Flag. Combination of 
combination of the bright, bright yellow and a maroon and green. Now, here's the Swaziland team. Now, this is a very interesting team. Remember the age old king died with his 600 wives, whatever it was? Now, all of the young people, look, look, look at this, sir. The Swaziland traditional native costume, but all of the young people in this team have shaved their hair as a mark of respect to the dead king. How extraordinary. I can you're, see you're, them now. I yes. can see, see them. The, 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 the younger, younger ones. You know? Yes. Not the older ones, the younger ones. The younger ones, yes. yes. The younger there's ones there's he was a very popular man. In fact, I think he was the oldest reigning monarch in the world. He was, yes, that's true. Now, Tanzania coming up next. Here they are. Tanzania on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. They've produced some magnificent athletes. We go back to Philbert Bay in 1974. The Raw, by the way, the Australian team is on the arena. They look magnificent. We'll come back to them later on. But Philbert Bay was a, won a world record in New Zealand. Shahanga won the gold medal for the marathon in 1978. He's competing this time over 10,000 metres. And they've got another great marathon runner. Did you now, see the height of the, of the stand carrier too? Exceptionally tall man. Now Tonga, and what we're going to do is show you on all of these teams. I think they all deserve to be seen. And we'll go right down to the end of the parade. We'll be seeing the Australian team come right down the strait. And Tonga, of course, in the Pacific Islands, a, a very friendly nation to Australia. A tinge of sadness for them too, Norman, because of that terrible cyclone that devastated them earlier this year. Only two of them, but they're here. Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Hazley Crawford is one of the world's great athletes carrying that flag. He won the Olympic Games 100 metres in 1976. Hazley Crawford, a tremendous performer, and that team, uh, only nine of them, but they produced some magnificent sprinters. Now behind them, Uganda, one of the African countries. Justin Arup, the javelin thrower, leading his team of 20. And we're getting on down towards the end of the parade now. There's still about half a dozen teams to go before Australia. And there's the map. I think, Geraldine, is this a first for Vanuatu? I think it must be. Yes. First appearance. I think it's the first of two. Zimbabwe and Vanuatu, two new countries in the game this year. And there it is, Vanuatu and the New Hebrides, not too far away, a great holiday place, uh, open to all people from Eastern Australia. Port Vila, of course, a beautiful port there. Now, coming up next, the men of Harlem, the land of my fathers. Have you ever been at Carter Farms Park? No, well, one thing in my life I haven't done, and I'm very, oh, very sorry. You've you been there, Julie? Get there. I haven't, but I've been told that it is the most emotional experience a sportsman can can have. A team of 97 from Wales, a little principality, always dressed in scarlet. The traditional uniform of the Welshman. With their bright, bright red. And I think they're filling the pinch out there a bit now, don't you? I think the, the friendly games are setting in already. Look at the faces of the athletes. They look so happy. And the Welshman pass, passing the saluting dais. Well, from the Pacific area, coming up next is... Um, Western Samoa, isn't that right? That's right, that's quite right, Western Samoa. With a team, with a team of 14. Who look cold, I have to say. Yes, well, they, they come from a beautiful area in the Pacific, don't they? You can see that on the map and, uh, with those short sleeve shirts. <laughs> she was in the uh, South Pacific, wasn't she? <laughs> what they called a Bloody Mary, wasn't it? Oh, no. I'll let you say that. Now Zambia, well we're down, we're down to the Zest, let's pick up where Zambia is in the, that part of the world over on the African side. Joseph Poto, a boxer, is their standard barrier. And there's one female on the team, Hilda Musopa, who's 20 and who's an 800 metre. But here they've got two, no, that they're... would be a manageress, you see, one, one see. runner and one manageress. Now only one more team to go and then it's Australia's turn. <laughs> Now, in, in the games for the first time, Zimbabwe. The first time they've appeared. Let's see if, yes, it's Margaret uh, Sakala, the javelin thrower, is leading the parade. That's Don't where it is in the world. Zimbabwe, Don't. of course, in the middle of Africa. Look at the flag, Norman. Breathtaking. Black and white marching together. Now, here that roar, I don't think we need any introduction. There's no map where this country is, Australia. <laughs> and here they are, the 265-member team 
and carrying the standard is Rick Mitchell, the 400 metre gold medalist from 1978, and he won the silver medal at the Olympic Games in Moscow. There's the Australian flag, and there's Rick Mitchell, a lift of that crowd. What about his Australian uniform? Well, looks glorious, glorious colour blue, all in finest merino wool. They've decided they have all explained to me that they wanted, above all, a very casual look. So we've got... Tracy Wickham. Tracy. Blue's on top. Our only world record holder. Tracy Wickham's marching, and it means the swimmers are in there, and there's some hot performers in this team. And as host nation, it's going to be a tremendous fillip for this country in amateur sport to see what they can do. And they're really keen to get amongst those Canadians and Englishmen. And uh, whether they can do it, we'll, we'll learn in the next eight or ten days. Look at this, the whole Australian oh. team. What a few of them. A standing ovation from the crowd. Men are in natural coloured trousers and the women are wearing collots with matching shirts and striped ties and scarves. It must be great for the graziers to see their product being worn on the Australian team. Even Mr Fraser's clapping and smiling. Of course, they all the teams go down past the saluting dais and they move into the middle area where they wind up. But I think what we'll do is count, yes, the number of the teams there. But you're going to say something, Jerry? I was going to ask you who that was. I don't know. I know about 250 of them. The 15, I don't know. Well, there they are. They're all there. They're from all parts of the globe. Let's have a look at the map of the world. And they're shown here in gold. The old saying, the sun never sets on a brick bar. Cecil Rhodes will be proud of you. It is a tribute, though, to the old empire that it has managed to transform itself into this fantastic display of cooperation. And there's the band. What a great performance that was. Non-stop, non-stop they've been performing. And Walsh and Matilda, I think, is their favourite hit tune today. Red, white and blue. The Army, Navy and Air Force, 240 strong, the combined services band. Inside the fence, 6,000 children, 2,000 athletes, and that's the view high on the hill here at Nathan in Brisbane, the opening ceremony of the 12th Commonwealth Games. Norman, I think it's a credit. There aren't many spectacles around nowadays, are there? This is, this is really something to remember. And it already, as I said, looks like the friendly games. Apparently when they devised the idea right back in the 20s, they, they wanted to be merrier and less stern than the Olympics, which of course Baron de Coubertin had revived in the 1890s. And it's really lasted through to the present day. I mean, right. you've been to a lot of Olympics. I imagine they're much more intense. I, I prefer always to go to the Commonwealth Games. They're a much better trip, it's much more relaxed and friendly. You have no language problem for a start. Everybody speaks English. And uh, because of that, I can look back and, and the more pleasurable experience have been at the Commonwealth Games, strange enough. As I said, Edinburgh has always been my favourite. Well, the teams are just about in position. What's your counting, Nigel? Remember, count along 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 6, 38, 40, 42, 44, 45. We have equaled the record for the number of teams at the Commonwealth Games. That record of 45 countries was set in Edmonton in 1978, and the Cook Islands, of course, couldn't compete. That would have made it 46. So we've only equal the record to start, but let's hope we break something before these games are over. That'll do me. Either. Now, when the band gets into position, the next part of the ceremony would be the arrival of the Queen's message, and Sir Alexander Ross is now moving across to the other side of the running track, and he will invite his Royal Highness, after the message arrives, to read the Queen's message. So he's just coming across, you see the figure there in blue on the other side there, just coming across the track. Now, 
It's a secret who the last runner is. Now, if it's a man, I'll say who this girl then. If it's a woman, it's your privilege. All right, now, I'll, say, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a guess that we're going to be very, very pleasantly surprised. You think it's going to be my turn to speak? I think it is. Well, the mouse was just been made to say it. There it is, right. Raylene Boyle, marvellous. The obvious choice. Norman, this is... How many games has she competed in now? This is her fourth Commonwealth, I think. Yes, she's about to compete in her fourth fourth. Commonwealth Games. She's competed in three Olympic Games, and this will make seven in all. She has won six gold medals in Commonwealth sport, and if she can win the 400 metres next Monday, she will equal Marjorie Jackson's record of seven gold medals as an Australian athlete. Of course, Michael Benton, the swimmer, has won nine gold medals, but here she is. Here she is. uh, One of our greatest athletes, Raylene Boyle, and this must be one of the highlights of her illustrious career, which has come through since 1970. And Raylene here's Boyle. the Queen's relay baton with Her Majesty's message. What a proud moment it must be Look for Look at Raylene. the crowd waving to her. Look at the children waving to her. The baton. She's a supreme competitor, Raylene, isn't she? She just gears herself up for the games. Even if she's been ill earlier, she gears herself up for that competition. Well, you know that one of the biggest days of ticket sales, apart from the opening closing ceremony, is next Monday when Raylene runs over 400 metres. And... Uh, as I said, that's magnificent. But here she is in the back straight. Raylene Boyle just doing one lap of the track. She'll do that at a much faster speed next next Monday. But what a thrill for her. The, Vic- the Victorian blonde, Raylene Boyle. Has How old was she when she first competed? Oh, about... 16. Yes. She was described by Jesse Arms as potentially the greatest female sprinter in the world. Unfortunately, she has never won an Olympic gold medal. She was beaten by a twentieth of a second. Uh, over in, um, I think it was Munich, wherever it was. I just remember which games it was. And she ran in 1968. Yes, must have been in 1972. Beaten by a mere 20. A number of silver medals in the Olympic Games, but an enormous record in Commonwealth Games of six gold medals and one silver. Uh, as I say, she has the chance now to equal the great Lithgow Flats, Marjorie Jackson, who, by the way, marched for the Australian team as the manager yesterday. Mm-hmm. Look at the Lithgow Flats. Look at her face. Look at her. She looks so excited. She must have been shattered in Montreal when she broke twice, Norman. Ah, oh, well, that's how it goes. But she's still there. She's a magnificent runner. I hope she goes. And I would, I would think this is not the first time that she has met the Duke of Edinburgh. And she's, of course, one of our commentary team, Norman. Yes, that's true. And His Royal Highness, having dutifully received the message, no doubt will hand the carrying object back to Raylene and Sir Alexander Ross will speak. Your, your Royal Highness, may it please you to read Her Majesty the Queen's message and declare these 12th Commonwealth Games open. On the 24th of June, just over three months ago, I entrusted this message to the first of the Queen's relay runners in London. Since then, it has traveled nearly 18,667 miles and passed through 3,219 hands, visiting on its way every state in Australia. It's 52 years since the first games were entrusted to Hamilton in Canada, and this is the third time that they've been held in Australia. As Queen of Australia, I warmly welcome you and look forward to joining you in a few days' time. I know that all Australians wish you good fortune and happiness during your visit, for which you have, been, you have prepared and trained so hard. Enthusiasm for sport is a well-known characteristic of Australians, and the presence in this stadium of so many competitors shows that this enthusiasm is shared throughout the Commonwealth. I congratulate all those who have been responsible for staging the Games in this wonderful setting. The Games are a highlight in our Commonwealth calendar. We are a voluntary association of many friendly nations, well represented in Brisbane. But it is not the number that matters, rather the friendliness. The Games provide a wonderful opportunity to cement friendships amongst people who share a common language, but who might otherwise never have met. Whether as a medalist on the rostrum or whether you fall in the first round, 
whether you're a member of the Federation Council or the leader of a team or simply one who works hard behind the scenes, I'm sure that all of you will enjoy to the full this special Commonwealth occasion. By the time I see you, I'm sure you will, you will have already gained the happiest of memories of Brisbane and of the 1982 Commonwealth Games, which I have asked Prince Philip as your president on my behalf to declare open. Royal Highness, accompanied by Sir Edward Williams, will move back to the Royal Box, and I see that Raylene Boyle is going with them too. There's Raylene, very, very happy, and uh, I know that every Australian will be wishing Raylene all the best in their 400 metres, and uh, of course we have the honour too, uh, hearing from her uh, as part of the ABC commentary team later on. Now we come to a, a more solemn part of the parade and the occasion, and that's when the trooping of the ceremony will follow. And the band will move into position, and the flag will be carried with slow march um, right down the straight to the flagpole, which is situated on the southeastern corner of this ground. But I think so far, Geraldine, it's been a great opening ceremony, and, and everything has done so surprisingly quickly. It's, uh, we're right on schedule. I just looked at my watch. Even a bit earlier. So the band on the far side is moving around to the top of the straightway, the, the main straight here at the stadium, and then we'll see the Lord Mayor of Brisbane will come into action with the uh, ceremonial flag. Now this is a... From the rest, from, from here on in, it's a very precise form of traditional ceremony, I understand, Norman. The trooping the flag, the raising the... the, uh, the raising up the standard, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's been done exactly the same way in, in all Over games. Years. Yes, it has. It's a, it's a means of doing it. But I think that we're, 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 irrespective of the tradition, the person reading the oath of the athletes is Tracy Wickham. Now, Tracy, without question, is the Queen of Brisbane. Now, when she does it, she's going to get an enormous reception. You know? and, uh, I think the selection by the officials of, first of all, Rick Mitchell to carry the standard was a good one. But to have Raylene Boyle bringing that Queen's message was a classic. And I think Tracy Wickham to read it uh, is also a classic. And it, it embraced in the Australian team the three people who would say, well, let's pick it out of those three, but let's give them all a job. And they've done that. And they've done it very, very well. Now, here's the ceremonial flag being carried to the northern end. And this flag will be brought down by an honour guard. Now, the honour guard, uh, just marking time at the top of the straight, and... I think this is one of the, the moments I think I'll remember. I'll just get on the forerunner to this, that the mass band is going to play a slow march. Now, you're going to recognise what the first part of this slow march is, and I think this is a brilliant piece of work. I think we'll just leave it to them to hear what it is, and then you'll see it. But at the moment, the ceremonial back. Uh, so Alexander Ross on the right-hand side. The Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Lord Alderman Mayor Roy Harvey, accompanied yes. by his aide. Now, they'll hand over the ceremonial flag, and that will be carried by the party, the flag party, right down the straight, halfway round the running track to the flagpole, which is situated fly for the whole duration of the Games. This will be a slow march, of course, and just looking around the arena, you can tell by the expression on people's faces what this whole ceremony has done for them. You can just see that it's, it's, it's created a tremendous impression. I think it was, overall, it's a brilliant piece of work. I mean, I, think, I don't think I've seen the Australian games have done this as well. Any of which much better, of course, than Sydney in 1930. I wasn't there. I was around, but I wasn't there. <laughs> but I was in Perth in 1962. But I've been to many Commonwealth games. And I suppose it's a little unfair to compare this to the Olympic Games in Moscow where there's a huge outlay of, of the money there to put 5,000 gymnasts and all of these things they did but with the facilities available here I certainly think it can be compared to Moscow but for the Commonwealth Games there's been none better than this. I think it's just such a they've just hit such a perfect blend of, of youth, of sport, 
of Australia, of, of, the, of the combined heritage. I just think it, it just sits so well with Australia. Well, also, that I, I believe in the Commonwealth Games and in, indeed the Olympic Games that you can be parochial. I mean, you can be nationalistic and say it's an Australian thing and this really has been an Australian ceremony. Absolutely, and that seems to me to have been their, their, their motto as they went through it. If you look at it, the whole thing fits into an Australian, an Australian context. And it's not over yet because, as I said, that you're going to hear the first part of this slow march and I'll just leave it to you <laughs> to see if you can pick it out. There's the unfurling of the flag. Another beautiful, beautiful blue colour. All members of the crowd have been invited to stand as the flag passes them. which was a favourite of Lord Mountbatten, Lord Louis Mountbatten. First written for his uncle, the Duke of Russia, and first presented to the Marines when Lord Louis was in command. And it's one of his great favourites.
the announcement, the raising of the Commonwealth Games ceremonial flag. The carrying party now to the base of the flagpole, attaching the flag as the band marches away at uh, normal speed. And the flag will soon drop the pole, and the those carrying party can make even a simple process by tying a flag to a piece of rope into a very a matter of real precision. Now here it is. It's waiting for commands. They will not let the flag at any point touch the ground. The attachment has been made at both ends. They operate under a strict sequence of orders, and you'll see one by one the lad has raised up the flag, the left go with her hand, and bit by bit the flag will go. First one goes, and along it goes, no part of that flag will touch the ground. When the flag reaches the top of the ball, ladies and gentlemen, it's rolled up salute to be by a 101 field battery first. Now, there it is, you see now, that one by one, they let it go, not easy to hold. Look at that, they've almost lost their balance there. They've almost pulled over by the wind. Now, as the last of the party allows the flag to go, the 12 gun salute will be fired, and I think we talk now of the previous games in the whole history of these British Empire as they were worked for and now the Commonwealth Games. The first games were held in 1930 in Hamilton and Ontario, and 11 countries competed. Then in 1934 they were held in London, 16 countries competed, and following that, yet the first time in Australia in 1938 in Sydney, and 15 countries competed. There was a gap for the Second World War of 12 years when they went to Auckland with 12 countries in 1954 to Vancouver in Canada with 24 and back to Cardiff in Wales in 1958 with 35 countries. In 1962 in Perth, one I remember so well, 35 countries competed. In 1966 in Kingston, Jamaica, 34 countries competed. And in 1970 in Edinburgh, Norman's favourite, 42 countries. And then it was 1974, Christchurch, New Zealand with 39 countries. In 78, Edmonton with 46 countries. And now Brisbane in 1980 and I think it's 45 countries, so we're down one. So a summary, including Brisbane, in Australia three times, in Canada three times, in New Zealand twice, in England, Wales, Scotland and Jamaica, one each. And so the flag reaches the top of the flagpole here at the 12th Commonwealth Games in Brisbane, 1982. marking this current one in Brisbane. And so the last pigeon has been released, and so there's one still there. Won't leave the top of the truck. <laughs> Very funny moment there. You we can't couldn't see quite it, pick it up. But one pigeon just sat on top of that huge truck there and didn't go. It simply would not move. 
Might have been on strike. Oh, possibly. Didn't, well, like, didn't like what she saw. <laughs> so at uh, 20 minutes to five on um, a fairly coolish and windy Sunday afternoon in Brisbane, the 30th of September 1982, the games have been opened. Uh, all that remains now is the reading of the oath and the flag bearers are coming out to form a semicircle around the podium, which is in the, the on the other side of the running track. And the honour to read this goes to one of Australia's greatest athletes. If you call that in the general sense of athletics, she's a swimmer. She's the only world record holder in this country. She set one of those world records four years ago in Edmonton for 800 metres freestyle. She also holds the world record for 400 metres freestyle. Her name is Tracy Wickham, and I interviewed her a few months ago, and she said, if anybody's going to break their, those records, I hope it's me. And I, bet I can tell you that she's going to go very, very well in these games. Norman... From what one reads, Tracy has become a little jaded, a little tired. Is that is that fair? Don't believe what you read, Joel. <laughs> she is very, very fit, and she's absolutely confident. And um, I think she's going to go out from these games in a blaze of glory. And coming up, we should see Tracy Wickham in just a moment. Yes, here she is, Tracy Wickham. Well, if there was a Queen of Brisbane, they'd make this one, Queen of Brisbane. Tracy Wickham, a tremendous performance, one of the greatest women in history. that we will take part in the Commonwealth Games of 1982 in the spirit of true sportsmanship, recognising the rules which govern them and desirous of participating in them for the honour of our Commonwealth and for the glory of sport. And listen to the ovation the crowd's giving her. Yes, the standing out for the, the standard bearer, of course, is Rick Mitchell, the gold medalist in 78, along with Tracy. As I can only emphasize, as we said before, it was a wonderful choice to have Rick carrying the standard, Tracy to do the oath, and Raylene Boyle to be the Queen's Messenger. Now the Royal Car will come in for the departure of His Royal Highness, which will bring to the close this opening ceremony. Time, 18 minutes to four. It's worked absolutely perfectly to schedule. Uh, no disturbances. Uh, nothing went wrong. Uh, I think they were very, very wise in cutting out the the parachuters, there could have been trouble there in those high winds, and it was just one of those things, it's bad luck for them, but everything else went exactly the clockwork. And in fact, because of the no parachute jumping, the ceremony is perhaps a little bit earlier than expected. Well, I think Norman would have been absolutely tragic had anything even vaguely gone wrong. Even the other day, during the rehearsal, if you recall, one of the parachutists ended up behind the stadium because he was caught in a sudden thunderstorm. Another one was taken up about 10,000 feet. And another one was injured by hail because he was caught in an updraft. And that was on a, a much less windy day than this. Well, Sir Alexander Ross, no doubt, very, very happy there with His Royal Highness. And uh, they go across to depart. And, um, Geraldine, you know, that's your first broadcast of an opening ceremony. Yes, I'll take a deep breath now. <laughs> or shall I breathe out? Oh, Norman, it's been fantastic. Absolutely marvellous. I must admit... From Sydney, where I live now, there has been muted interest in these games up until the moment, up until today, and so, for me in particular, it's been a great, great thrill. I know that hasn't been the case in Brisbane. Well, the interest has always been here, and you'll find now that with the television, will be around the rest of Australia, well, that the, the publicity hasn't been there, but although, uh, in the fundraising, you know that New South Wales put in as much as Queensland, and the big sales of the... Uh, well, here it is, it's Australian anthem, we won't talk over that, we'll just have to hear us advance Australia for...
so ends the opening ceremony of the Brisbane Commonwealth Games of 1982. And of course the games proceed now for a, a further nine days to end up on Saturday. Well, by the way, uh, Geraldine, what are you doing about half past four next Saturday week? I might be back here, Norman. You will? Well, I don't think I've had a better offer yet, so uh, I think I'll be back here. You'll come back and uh, broadcast the closing ceremony. That's the date we've got. <laughs> half past four next Saturday week, the closing right, ceremony. Norman. And I hope between now and then, those of you from all parts of Australia are going to see some magnificent competition. You're going to get eight hours a day of it, as much as you like on the ABC. You'll see it all. And uh, this is the game station, the ABC. It's going to be live. I'm doing the swimming. It's live at half past seven at night for six straight days. It's Will there be another gold, gold, oh, gold, 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 That's gold. what we I want to know. So. We're all see, waiting. I want to see Tracy Wickham go around. I reckon he's going to be magnificent <laughs> because these swimmers of Australia are really fired and I think that's going to apply right for the Australian team. And, and here it is, the closing of this, broad, this telecast. It's been a pleasure working with you, Geraldine, and I hope we do it again. Thank you, Norman, very much. Likewise. So, from QE2 Stadium at Nathan in Brisbane, from Geraldine Dew and Norman May, ABC Sport. moment for Mike O'Rourke and they say that Sydney is about the second biggest New Zealand city in the world. <laughs> There's plenty of Kiwis out there in the stand cheering him on. Let's go back to the diving until our next middle presentation. So diving in his home state. Michael's going to perform the same dive for us here in this session. Off the three metre board. Yes, good hurdle again. Open pike. That's a good dive. That's slightly better than the last one. Lined the finish up a little bit better and took the dive a little higher into the air. Strong hurdle and really used the legs there to go take the dive straight up, turning round and a vertical entry. Feet a little bit loose going in the water. Quite a good total for Michael Rutherford, 31.68. Now Mark Graham from New Zealand, 21 years of age. And he performed very well in the Commonwealth Games in this uh, event, three, um, three metre. Mark did a fine job for New Zealand in the Games. A forward dive pike. A little short on the board there, got stuck and rolled it over a little bit. You'll see from the slow motion replay that he lands quite short on the end of the board and had to take the dive almost straight up. There it is, short on the end of the board and very close to the board coming past. A little bit of a scare to the judges and just flipping it over a fraction. Well, one judge, was, scores, uh, one judge was very scared, gave a four and a half. 4.5 to seven is the total of the four, round 30 for Mark Graham. Now, Sean Panay from Australia. Sean's doing a forward dive pike. 1.5 is the degree of difficulty. Well on the end, good pike. A little, little bit shaky lining that up at the end there. Didn't quite get it, get it settled early, but still a good dive. He's happy about it. On to the end. Touch of the toes. Little bit of movement in lining that up. And 30.15 the total for Sean Panay from Australia. Next is Billy Yang from Hong Kong. Known as the porcupine. That's fairly obvious for just having a look at his hair. Look at that smile. been lowered and the ceremonial party will remove it, will prepare it for formal removal from the stadium.
they will march the flag at shoulder level. I would think anti-clockwise around the stadium. Accompanied by the combined bands. escort the ceremonial carrying of the flag to Sir Alexander Ross who will present the flag to the Lord Mayor of Brisbane. It's a very precise ceremony again just as it was on opening day. A ceremony the flag is being marched anti-clockwise throughout the arena. They're breaking the standards of the Commonwealth Games Federation, also the Australian flag, the host nation to the Commonwealth Games here in 1982, and also the Scottish flag, the host nations for the Games to come in 1986. The Australian flag, the Federation flag, and on the right-hand side, the Scottish flag.
shortly, Her Majesty the Queen and the Prince Philip will leave from the main ring. With us all games competitors in L stand. Uh, here are all the athletes running on to the arena now from their position over on the far side. And leading up looks like, is it Neil Brooks? He's swimming with the Australian flag. Not Neil Brooks, but uh, somebody. I think it's almost appropriate, Norman, for these games <laughs> to have the athletes running past the ceremonial folding of the flag. <laughs> Soldiers going about their task with ramrod precision despite a great many threats, distractions. Commonwealth Games Federation, I entrust this ceremonial flag to your care. And I ask that in due time, you or your successor in office will deliver it to the chief citizen of the city of Edinburgh, which will be the host of the 13th Commonwealth Games. This duty I willingly undertake to fulfill. Now, Sir Alexander Ross will formally invite Her Majesty the Queen to close the game. Your Majesty, may it please you to proclaim these 12th Commonwealth Games closed. I declare the 12th Commonwealth Games Australia closed and in accordance with tradition I call upon the sportsmen and women of the Commonwealth to assemble in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1986 to celebrate the 13th Commonwealth Games. May they display cheerfulness and concord so that the spirit of our family of nations may be carried on with ever greatness and ever greater eagerness, courage and honour for the good of humanity and the peace of the world. this closing ceremony here in Brisbane 1982, the last little section of the games. The ceremonial flag has been carried back to the 
royal enclosure. There'll be a fanfare and then an indication that Her Majesty will leave the stadium. of the competing countries, all 45 of them, leave this arena, and I should think they'll leave with very, very pleasant memories. And by that I mean the people, not the flags. There was a valiant attempt, which we couldn't quite see here, to redress the fault of the opening ceremony and to put Tasmania in the picture. All the athletes and the, and the uh, officials were assembled on the track, and when we looked down, we saw that there was a little finger of, of officials stretched out at the bottom right-hand corner, and I, we're quite sure that the intent was there to symbolise Tasmania, so maybe that'll soothe a few of the hurt feelings. Standard bearers have left, all the flag carrying guards have left the arena. Only one thing that remains now is the departure of Her Majesty the Queen. marching around, or That's shall we say, gaily dancing around. Well, everybody now has been invited to sing. It's called Everybody Sing, and I should think they'll have Old Lang Syne and a few other songs like that. I think everybody had their own personal memories of that opening ceremony and all through the games. What was really terrific about the games was they offered everybody different sorts of highlights. You could choose your own. What, what would yours be, Norman? What would your highlight be? I'm trying be? to think back. It's, uh, there were so many of them over the swimming pool. We had so much excitement and drama and great things happening there. I'd have to think about it for a while. I might, I might get to come up with something before we leave this telecast. Australian athletes. Now, can they get through? All the words of the songs being punched up on the board so that everybody can sing along too. And they are too. Listen in, Peter Mears. You might get some songs yet. with posing of flowers as she is trying to make her way down with Sir Alexander Ross to her car, but I think she's going to have quite a job of it. She looks to have enjoyed herself enormously, I think, today.
into the handshaking already. And there she is somewhere, somewhere in the middle of that. I can't even spot from this particular high shot. I can't even spot the car. No, the athletes have formed a little path there. They've done the right thing. You see that there's a little alleyway there for her to go through, and there's no problem at all. She's straight through to the car. Well, it's all good natured. There's no, no problem there. That run through the arm there, right into the limousine. scene. That wasn't too bad. The Duke has been presented with a little Matilda. Trying to pick a couple of the faces of the Australian athletes around the car. Now's the hour. Mary, farewell. I think they've decided to go right round the track once again. They're going to stand up and go around again before the whole crowd. This is a wonderful tribute to this crowd here at Brisbane. I, I don't know that it was quite the Queen's idea. I would think it would be Royal Command. We can see Christine stand on the high jumper to the left of the Queen's car. A very happy pandemonium raining down there. She really does look excited. As I say in Edinburgh, old Lang Syne. herself may be uh, very moved by this. She looks genuinely thrilled. There's such excitement out there. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I wonder who will win this tussle. 
Well, there it is. The Commonwealth Games, Brisbane, 1982 are over. I think, Geraldine, that's going to be a very hard act to follow with the next program. I, I just can't imagine a town getting more behind the games than these Brisbane people have. I wish... I'm, I know it, Norman said the... Ed the Edinburgh Games were superb when they were held in 1970, but... I know now they can do it again, but this has been something to remember. Alexander Ross, the National Theatre of Nigeria, the Maori group and the dancing group from Papua New Guinea and they follow in sequence behind Matilda. Dance Company of Zimbabwe. Followed by the dreaded Matilda with those amazing eyes. Both of which blink, so I'm not quoted again for saying only one of them works. I gather, Norman, you're actually up on the board of uh, the ABC uh, broadcast studio as a winner of the tautology stakes. So there's only one word for it, protest dismissed. <laughs> That's right. The one word was dismissed. <laughs> Celebration rather than a presentation of this ceremony we're watching now. A celebration of all the countries who've taken part in these games. Nigeria next to them, the Maori group, and on the left-hand side, the, the group from Papua New Guinea. And over there, too, we have some Mounties coming up. Three left-hand side, if you see them, and we get a wider shot. It's a short segment from a Nigerian opera.
And the school board announces the next group, the, the dancers from Papua New Guinea. And now we're waiting to be told who the next group are. Ah, this is the National Dance Company of Zimbabwe back again. cards for the games. That's an amazing thing. They're obviously athletes and they're the e-cards they wear and this is the dance company of Nigeria and they're going to be replaced by our Maori friends from across the Tasman. Just to uh, remind you that this cultural festival was started only in Edmonton when the Sri Lankan government approached the organisers of the Edmonton Games requesting that they be given permission to send a cultural rather than an athletic team. So this is, this is the, the next stage on. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
receiving a great applause from what I had no I've already seen as a big group of New Zealanders in the crowd today. And now everybody's assembling for the dragon dance. dragon or group of them ah here he is now is about 200 feet in length and it's the longest of its kind in the southern hemisphere the dragon of the Australian Chinese Association Chinese dragon dance. In the spring, the mythical dragon dances to chase away all evil spirits. That's supposed to bring good luck and prosperity to all who see it. I'm not quite sure whether Matilda falls into that category or not. She seems to have been blinded by the smoke. Now, you saw there just briefly bidding fond farewell to Matilda as she's leaving the scene, going through the exit gate now, and one of the great stars of these games. to actually uh, break, get down to the details of what it is, but it, the dragon is actually constructed of bamboo, paper mache and fabric, and it requires about 100 people to operate. So it's uh, quite a complex little achievement.
Now, this is the plate from the New York, New York. It's uh, sponsored by a hotel here, as a reminder. They, a group of people in the United States haven't been a member of the Commonwealth since 1776, they tell us. But this is a, a sand dune with a tribal rock group from Papua New Guinea. is the ABC flag. You know what I mean? We don't often wave our flag like this, not quite.